All right, B-listers, you know the drill. This is your official spoiler alert for the episode. If you don't want any spoilers, stop the episode now. And if you don't care about spoilers, hold on to your seats because this episode starts now. Hi, Liz. Hi, Court. And hello, fellow B Critics. Welcome to another episode of the B Critics Podcast. This movie was all over the place. It left you with more questions than it answered. And yeah, I think that that covers it. <laughs> yeah, I would say more questions than answered definitely covers <laughs> it. Um, but before we really get into it, let's tell the people where to find us. So you can follow the podcast, that's us, on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Be Critics Podcast. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow our Instagram for all the best movie content. Okay. I think it's time to get into the episode. All right. So we're doing a solo episode, like just us, no guests today. Just the two and of us. Just yeah, Liz. the two of us. I was thinking maybe... <laughs> You could have the opportunity to introduce the movie today. Oh my gosh, I feel so honored. <laughs> um, yeah, so today we're talking about Don't Worry Darling. Yeah. It <laughs> another, is another fabulous Pew movie. Yes, it's another one in our Florence Pew season. Mhm. And another female director. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah, we do have a female director. We're going to talk all about it. I'm ready. (laughs) Yeah, I'm ready. I know you're ready. I saw your rating on this one, so I know you are ready to talk about it. All right. So Don't Worry Darling tells the story of a young married couple, Alice, played by Florence Pugh, and Jack, played by Harry Styles, and what appears to be the perfect 1950s life in the dystopian community called Victory. As the viewer, you are almost immediately led into the bit when Alice's ex-friend, Margaret, starts to publicly question the community and its leaders. Some very strange things start happening to Alice, but the rest of the community and her husband try to convince Alice that she's imagining things and her memories are distorted. A psychological thriller ensues in which Alice discovers that her reality might not be quite so real and victory might not be quite so perfect. Mm -mm. Victory is perfect, (laughs) that's for sure. It's a fun story. I'll give it that. Yeah, it is. It's definitely an interesting story. Um, I would say it's pretty unique. So, well, kind of. Yeah, it's it's a good story. It has a lot going on. Lots to talk about. A lot to talk about. Yes. So this movie is just shy or just a little bit over two hours long. So it's two hours, three minutes. Mm -hmm. It's a mystery. It's kind of like a psychological thriller. Mm -hmm. Its rating is R. Yeah. Yeah. That makes it sense. does make sense, but also I feel like the things that it's rated R for really weren't that bad. It has some like pretty explicit sex scenes. I think that's the only thing really that makes it. Yeah, rated but nobody's R. naked. Yeah, but they do like thrusting. And remember we talked about Twilight, and I feel like they like couldn't do any thrusting. <laughs> like that made it that would make it go over the PG thirteen threshold. Like you could tell they were doing it. Um, yeah. That's and, like, true. there's, like, she kills Harry Styles. Like, we see her kill him. Yeah, but it's really not that, it's not, like, that bad. Like, some of, I feel like some of the, like, Marvel or superhero movies, like, show way worse violence. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I don't, I, I was, I mean, I think everybody could hear that I was surprised as I was reading that it was rated R. <laughs> I was like, Really? <laughs> That's kind of strange. Yeah. I don't know that it needs to be PG-13. Like, I feel like a 13-year-old, like, may not really get everything that's going on with it. But I feel like R is kind of harsh. Well, in the U.S., we don't really have an in-between. So (laughs) there we go. It came out in PG-13 with an asterisk. 2022. (laughs) It was produced by Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned that we have a female director, and that director is Olivia Wilde. I'm a huge Olivia Wilde fan. I think she's a fabulous actress. 
Um, this was her. This was not her debut. This was her sophomore movie. Yep, this was her second one. Yeah, I was surprised so. by that. I thought it was her debut director role, and so mm-hmm. I was fact checking that the other day, and that is not the case. This was yeah. Her second. I saw too um, where she like did an interview and they asked her about it. They're like, "Are you nervous?" And she was like, "Absolutely." Like yeah. your second one is so much harder and so much more criticized than your first one every time. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't even I couldn't oh. even tell you what her first movie was. I looked it up like literally 2 days ago. I guess it doesn't matter. It's yeah, not no that important. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Actually, I think it was like a a big movie. <laughs> Let's really? see. Yeah, look that up while I'm mentioning our cast. So we've got our notable cast, which is obviously our girl Florence, Florence Pugh, and she plays the leading role in this movie. And then we have Harry Styles. We'll talk a lot about that. Olivia Wilde, she stars in the role. Her Mm -hmm. husband in the movie is Nick Kroll. We've got Gemma Chan, Chris Pine, and Kiki Lane. So I just finished looking it up. It was Booksmart. That was her directorial debut. Oh, yeah, debut. that was that was a big movie. <laughs> it was um, a big one. Very important movie. <laughs> yeah, which I actually didn't love that movie. I don't know that I've, I – I know I've seen it. I just don't remember it. Like, I don't remember the movie. Oh. <laughs> well, but it is a big one. People talk about it. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a known movie. It was movie. pretty successful. Interesting. I mean, I would say, like, people are – critics of this movie but I don't think by any means it was unsuccessful like I think in box office numbers it it was pretty successful um yeah Warner yeah brothers I think yeah. a lot of that has to do with the cast though like who was in it and it also has a lot to do with the drama that surrounded the making <laughs> of this movie which so much I feel drama. like we need to spend a lot of time talking about I remember when this movie was being made and all the drama around it because mm-hmm. it was just so much. It was in every pop culture podcast that I listened to. Like they were talking about Olivia Wilde, Harry Styles, Shia LaBeouf, Florence Pugh, everything. Um, mm-hmm. So we're going to spend some time talking about it. And the first thing is the whole Shia LaBeouf thing because Shia LaBeouf was originally cast in this movie and the i i'm going to i'm just going to say this i don't think he i don't think he would have fit in in this movie i don't think it would have been the same if Shia LaBeouf was playing jack i have thoughts on that i definitely think it wouldn't have been the same and you're going to hate me for this but i think florence pugh acted circles around Harry Styles. And I I have nothing against Harry Styles. I actually adore Harry Styles and I'm obsessed with Harry Styles. And he's not even a bad actor. But Mm -hmm. Florence Pugh is like in a whole league above him. And I think Shia LaBeouf could have matched her acting abilities. Shia LaBeouf is a much better actor than Harry Styles. And so I think that would have changed the movie. It would have been different. But I think – it would have been different in a good way. I think Harry Styles was perfect in this role. I you're going to say that. <laughs> like, I I agree that Florence Pugh is, like, obviously the better actor. I mean, yeah. Harry Styles is not an actor. He's a singer. Um, but I thought he did a really good job. I thought he was believable. And I thought it worked really well that he was like kind of a background character because you kind of like forgot about him sometimes. And I think that kind of worked to like the story's advantage because you weren't paying attention to what Jack's doing over here. You're paying attention to what Florence is doing or Alice is doing. You're paying attention to Bunny and you're paying attention to like all the people that are doing like the core acting because I don't think Jack was super important. Like his character was not as important. Like I think Jack's character was super important. He was the but, mastermind behind it all. Well, but what I'm saying is they tried to like he's supposed to come off as it's he's not important. I guess. Well, so I want to talk about Shia LaBeouf being fired because the controversy <laughs> around that all happening is that when 
Shia LaBeouf was fired, his like legal team came out and said that he was not in fact fired, that he left because he didn't have enough time to rehearse on the set. And so I was reading about like what Olivia Wilde had to say about it. And she basically was like, her statement had the word conducive in it like three times. And she was like, I just don't think that like Shia's method of acting is conducive with the way that we want to like run our production. It was like a lot of like fluffy words. And so the controversy is, did Shia LaBeouf get fired or did he walk out? I think it doesn't matter. Like, I think like he had nothing else going on. So he was removed or moved himself from the movie. Like, what does it matter if he got fired or left? Either way, it's not good. Like, it doesn't look good either way. Well, I don't know if it doesn't look good for him or if it doesn't look good for Olivia Wilde. That's up for you to decide. Um, I think it doesn't look good for him. I think it makes him look like he's difficult to work with. Whether he decided to leave because he didn't have adequate rehearsal time, which everyone else seems fine with, or if he was fired because he's like combative and like wasn't getting along with people. Like either way, he looks bad. Well, he's not the only data point that it might not have been a him problem because Florence Pugh also was not promoting this film. Um, so she did not at the Venice Film Festival. She didn't participate in like the press box when they talked about it. Um, well, she said that was because she was filming another movie. Yeah, she said that. So like when all she said this it multiple times too. Like she made multiple statements. And yeah. like the cast also made multiple statements of like Florence Pugh has nothing like Florence Pugh and Olivia Wilde have no problems. Yeah, yeah, there that is what it was said. But I remember when I was <laughs> like when this was all happening, like that was the controversy was like is there something between Florence and Olivia and then like at the Venice Film Festival, like Harry Styles and Olivia Wilde, like weren't even like looking at each other. Cause that was the other piece of this, right? Like they were dating. Harry Styles and Olivia Wilde were dating. So there I thought was they a, started uh, dating like after he was cast. Well, like they weren't dating prior. There was a lot of question around that because it kind of goes into the timeline of like her divorce with Jason Sudeikis and like was she seeing Harry Styles before she got div- like before she got separated or after she got separated and like honestly that's her private life but like that it was like this was happening like kind of during COVID times and like all anybody cared about at this time was like all this drama surrounding this movie <laughs> and <coughs> yeah it I mean it was crazy like what came out of it was just some ridiculous stuff like Spitgate at the Venice Film Festival was this like idea that Harry Styles spit on Chris Pine. And like there was all this like video evidence of it and like people were like watching the video. It's and probably like, an accident. He's just like talking and spit came out of his mouth. Yeah, could have been that. <laughs> it could have not been spit. It could have like – but the – People were watching Olivia Wilde's <laughs> face and they were like, her face follows the spit. Like, he must have spit. And then Chris Pine's, like, legal or representatives had to come out and be like, Harry Styles never spit on Chris Pine. <laughs> like, that never happened. How childish and immature are we that we're like having to make formal, like, don't worry, everyone. The most famous young man in the world did indeed not spit on my client. <laughs> Well, like, yeah, what? and that that too, like Harry Styles was like so <laughs> famous. So there was this mm-hmm. this debate going around about like, well, did he deserve the part or did Olivia just cast him because they were dating or about to date or whatever? I and like he was perfect. Yeah, I think I people like him in the movie like and everything. I don't think that's true, but it is kind of weird. Like Florence, like typically before this was like, Every time she had a movie, she would heavily promote it on Instagram and she wasn't heavily promoting it on Instagram during the premieres and stuff. So it was like really weird and people were being suspect about it. I read some things too that Florence Pugh wasn't necessarily like um, happy with the way that Harry Styles was portrayed in the sex scenes and she, she felt like he was kind of being used 
and yeah yeah like he was like being used for his fame pretty much like people were like yeah. oh my god we get and like Harry she Styles was like text scenes. we've literally made this movie about like the most famous man in the world like going down on me and like that's like not even what this movie's about like that's okay but like that's we, what it is <laughs> we should go ahead and talk about that because all I could think about in that first sex scene where he goes down on Florence Pugh was watermelon sugar hi like that is literally I was like Olivia Wilde doing right now this is crazy like she is using him but you know what she got her point across she wanted to portray like female pleasure and she did so yeah I guess um yeah but so much controversy around the movie and I I guess it go I don't know um this note you have here about CinemaCon Oh, yeah. It's like kind of around the time. So she when this movie was like premiered, like the first time I was ever seen was at CinemaCon. And there was some I I don't even know, like if it was super obvious what was going on, but she was served her divorce papers like as she was getting up on the stage to introduce this movie at this like huge convention. And I mean, Jason Sudeikis came out and said, like, I would have never, like, told them to do that. I didn't okay that. Like, that was not something that I would have ever done to her. Um, Yeah. But it just, like, adds to the drama. Like, of course. Like, this too. Like, what else? (laughs) Yeah. Well, one thing, like, that's interesting, I think, about all the drama is Olivia Wilde went on Stephen Colbert, the, like, late show, after – I think after it premiered or like during the most of the hype when all this drama was happening. And she basically said that male and female directors are held to different standards. Mm-hmm. And so what like what she says, I have a couple of quotes from her here. She was saying like, I don't feel like my male directing colleagues are answering questions about their cast. And people were asking her like all about like the Harry Styles drama and the Chris Pine drama and the Florence drama. And like if I, I feel like it is standard to think about like a typical male film director and be like that man is a little batshit and like cuckoo out there. Like think about like Quentin Tarantino, right? Like he is weird and like they have reputations. People do call him out for the feet thing. Now they do. But like male directors are known for like berating people on sets and like being kind of crazy and like that was kind of the point that she was getting across i think there was some legitimately interesting drama surrounding her movie because she had harry styles in it and she was dating him and like well i was about to say like how many male directors cast their girlfriends or wives or anyone they're romantically affiliated with in their movies and if they do does that raise like (laughs) big red flags for everyone everyone's like no uh that's like a whole other conversation you know i mean how many like young actresses do you see dating older directors a ton a ton jennifer lawrence being an example right like it happens all the time and so like the double standard for olivia wilde is real like she gets treatment of like it all being publicized. But I, I mean, like it, it. here's what I have to say. Bad publicity is still publicity and they didn't have to pay for all that marketing. So a hundred percent. That's kind of what I was <laughs> saying before, like with the the success of the movie, like we can talk all we want about Harry Styles being a bad actor or mm-hmm. everyone whatever. wanted to see him in this movie. Everybody wanted to see this movie. <laughs> Everybody went and watched this movie. It was it was a, a huge box office success. So big success. Doesn't I matter. Agree. The drama was fun. I remember it being really fun because I, I we love drama it, like, as long as it's time. not our drama. Like yeah. if it's someone else's drama, love it. If we're and having this, drama, don't love it. And this drama was all super tame, right? Like it was Spitgate. Spit it wasn't Gate. like it wasn't like anything crazy. <laughs> so I love oh, it. No. That's why I think it's fun too, because it's kind of silly. Yeah, it is silly, and mm-hmm. like eh, whatever. It's over now and we can like laugh about it. It's fine. Yeah. Nobody died. Nah. So let's get into the movie. Let's talk about it. Okay. So 
in the opening scene, we are introduced to a young love drunk couple in the 50s. They are in a very- so cute. So cute. I thought yeah. they had really good chemistry on set. They are cute. Like they looked, they looked like they were in love. In my they opinion. They did. I think Harry Styles is like, he has that like boyish charm. He's you know? like, he's so cute. You just want to like love him. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm a fan. Yeah. And I think I've Florence never been a Harry Styles Blue. fan, but I think he should really? just like look like he does in this movie all the time with the he shorter does. hair and like the way he dresses. Like, I just think he looks so good. The whole like other than his weird scenes where he's like the ugly gross Jack. That's not it. <laughs> yeah. But the 1950s perfect Jack is everything. everything. Yeah, he's good. He's good. So they're living in a a very standard but quite perfect suburban community where the mm-hmm. women are housewives and the men all roll out for their nine to fives together in their perfectly shiny, like uh, open top cars. It never rains. It is always nice weather. Always nice. They're in like the desert in this like weird community called mm-hmm. Victory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no red so flags. I have no red flags. No red flags at all. <laughs> Except the expansive desert beyond that nobody is allowed to go to. Also, where do they get their groceries? I don't know. They just appear. What do they do all day? Sit by the pool. Shop. They don't have to pay for anything. Weird. Ride the trolley around. Yeah. <laughs> what? Just don't look behind. What is it? What do they say in The Wizard of Oz? Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, there's one rule. Don't question anything. <laughs> that is literally this movie. So early on in the movie, we get introduced to our cast. And really early on, we get like a bunch of like really quick and hushed dialogue scenes mm-hmm. um, where we're kind of getting introduced to like, we're not getting told the full story here kind of thing. Um, and our main girl we mentioned is Alice, and she's played by Florence Pugh. Yeah, fabulous. fabulous, fabulous, fabulous portrayal of this character. Like, so amazing. I also, I Florence Pugh has amazing hair. Her hair just looked so great the entire movie. I'm sure she's got like extensions in to make her hair fuller, but like. It just looked so good. I was like, is that a wig? No, that's her real hair. Her hair just looks like that. <sighs> she has good hair and good skin. Yeah, she does have really good skin. And eyes. She has really pretty eyes. Yeah, she's got it all. We're just going to talk about how good looking this cast is because <laughs> next up we have Harry Styles who plays the character Jack, her husband. Yeah. And also just a, a beautiful, beautiful human. He is really good looking. I've never thought he was that good looking because I think he had like the fluffy hair. I'm not into the fluffy hair. Like it's fine to have long hair, but like he he looked like he was 10. And but then I saw him in this movie and I was like, you are attractive, my friend. And like, I hope you're actually like this character because this character is so nice. He is so nice and so loving. Like they have just a sweet relationship is like that a little bit. Like if you've ever watched him interview, you can watch him on like um, the Late Late Show when he's with like One Direction. He's just like a smiley, like happy guy. I don't know how you don't think he's attractive. I think he's like one of the most attractive people on the planet. Um, Well, I have one thing to say, Harry Styles, if you're listening to the Be Critics podcast, Courtney is single and we would love to have you be part of our family. Agreed. (laughs) (laughs) I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Harry Styles, I love you. <laughs> Be part of our family. So nice. next we have Olivia Wilde at the time, uh, Harry Styles, true GF, not me. And she plays the character Bunny, who is Alice's neighbor, and her husband is played by Nick Kroll. Bunny, Olivia Wilde looked so good. Like, I know we keep saying that everybody. She looked so so good like the whole movie she just looked fabulous like i i was just like olivia wilde you are beautiful like in every sense of the word like everything she wore looked good even when she was being a little butthead she looked good like i just thought she looked fabulous 
I am a big Olivia Wilde fan. I watched House growing up, the TV mm-hmm. show. Did you ever watch that? No, but I know what you're talking about. She was like a main character in that show. And man, I just have a, a soft spot in my heart for her. She's amazing. I like haven't really watched a lot with her in it. I was kind of like going through her IMDb the other day mm-hmm. and realizing that I haven't, but I thought she was pretty good. I think she's a pretty strong actress. And mm-hmm. I thought it, I always think it's interesting, like when a director is in the movie that they're directing, like how that works. Like, yeah, I, I saw where um, she like somebody, people were asking her about that. And she was saying that there were scenes that she took Bunny out of so that she could be behind the cameras and yeah. directing the scene. Like the, the, at the end when they have that dinner party where everything's like revealed what's going on, um, Bunny's not there and it's like made into this like drama pity thing, whatever. But like she wasn't in that scene because she wanted to be directing the scene, which makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And she wasn't really missed in that scene. No, she wasn't necessary in that scene. No. Also, so, did you know that Olivia Wilde was supposed to be Alice? Really? She was like originally going to be Alice. And then she saw Florence Pugh in a movie. I'm assuming it's Midsommar. And she was like, I have to have this girl in my in my show, in my movie. And then she, the roles were reversed. And Florence Pugh was supposed to be Bunny. And Olivia Wilde was like, well, if I'm Alice, then that kind of changes the whole story because I'm older, which means that it's like a completely different, it's like a completely different story. So that's why she had Florence Pugh play Alice because it's like the young couple in love kind of thing. Interesting. Yeah. I cannot imagine it flipped. I'm really, really glad (laughs) she made that choice because I think – Florence and Harry being the stars of this movie, like make this movie. I, I don't agree. think I personally would have enjoyed this movie if it wasn't them. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I think, like you said, like they're kind of like fun to watch together. They're mm-hmm. cute. Yeah. They were really, really cute. Mm-hmm. And we did kind of allude to it, but they have these like sex scenes or not so sex scenes because most of them are just – Harry Styles eating out for it. <laughs> <laughs> like right off the bat, we get the one and he he throws her on the dinner table and all the food yep. just goes. She just that she just spent all. all day like slaving <laughs> around and they just like throw it across the dining room. Guess they're not hungry. <laughs> Harry Styles, again, you can become part of our family. <laughs> it would be amazing to have you. <laughs> We are we are um <laughs> taking applications. Harry Styles does not need to, to apply. <laughs> he doesn't need to apply. It's fine. Um so we get that one. I think he does it again. We also get this multiple scene. times. Yeah, and we get this scene with Chris Pine. So they go to Chris Pine's house. Yeah, what the um, heck was that? And he starts like watching like, them watching them and they use a mirror so basically what happens is chris pine is looking into florence Pugh's eyes while florence like through a mirror while florence Pugh is having sex with harry styles in chris pine's house or in frank's house and that just starts like for the rest of the movie chris pine starts like watching florence and it's so creepy but yeah that scene is memorable. I think that I actually like didn't was didn't like understand. I was like, is this happening? Is she like imagining him there? Why is she not saying anything? Like, Well, I think it was almost supposed to be like a scare tactic. Like but he- also, also at the end, sorry, I'm cutting you off. At oh, the end, man. at the dinner party, he mentions that Florence Pugh has been in his bed before. Or he mentions that she slept with her husband in his house yeah i thought he was saying that because he like the quote like the quote is that like i trusted you in my bed 
and she like quickly diverts. Yeah, but I think I think he whatever he said he was referring when I watched that I remember he was basically <clears throat> saying like I could tell everybody here that y'all had sex in my house. I I wrote down specifically that I was like, "Oh, gee, like did she sleep with Frank?" And just I was like, like "Wait, so she cheated on Jack with Frank?" <laughs> I That's literally what I wrote down. It is a psychological thriller, so it's like one of those things where because her it could literally be anything <laughs> was distorted. Maybe she was sleeping with him and her memories were like replaced with sleeping with Harry Styles. And that's why she basically like slipped is because they were like messing with her memories so much or something. Or maybe she like had an affair with him IRL. No, no, I don't think we don't know. Well, no. So the strange stuff really starts when Alice starts noticing that stuff is going on with her friend Margaret. Yeah. And at that same dinner party where we get the weird mirror sex scene, Margaret asks to like the whole community, why are we here in this town victory? Yeah. I immediately felt bad for Margaret. I was yeah, like, of girl, something's going on and you, my friend – they're going to make you feel like you have no idea what's going on. And they yeah. did. <laughs> yeah. And so like a really strange sequence of events basically follows this. And it kind of starts with like all the stuff with Margaret and then also all the stuff with like dancing class. Yeah, okay. The dancing class. This new girl shows up and she just knows the routine. Yeah. I was wondering that too. And they all just know the routine yeah. and they're Everything all just dancers. is very suspect. And like they didn't introduce the ballet instructor ahead of time. So like you didn't know who she was mm -hmm. until later you find out she's Frank's wife. Mm -hmm. But they were all acting so weird around her. I was like, is this lady holding them all captive? Like what? Like, you know, like you question, yeah. I question her for a while i was like what's going on with the shelly lady yeah and so during all of this like as we're getting the build up the film uses uh some pretty interesting stuff to like make it show that there's some sort of like distorted reality mm -hmm. and kind of combine alice's dreams with her reality and so we get a lot of like really quick cuts we get some interesting shots of kind of like mundane items that I think are meant to show symmetry because symmetry is like a theme that remains in the film. You know, like at the very end when they start chanting like symmetry, symmetry, symmetry. I think you know how there's like all those shots of like over the coffee cup and then they show the piece of toast and like cutting it perfectly in a diagonal. And I think they're that also showing like routine, how she's like doing the same thing every single day. Yeah, that's true. Yep. And then we also get a very synthy score and it contrasts with the like 50s piano jazz mu music that fills the rest of the movie. Yeah. So whenever we have these like weird moments, like the score gets really like dark and synthy. Yeah, and there's a a song that Harry Styles sings and that Florence Pugh sings throughout that's kind of like a trigger to Florence Pugh like coming out of the sh – should we just talk about what the end of the movie? Yeah, of just, course. Okay. Give it away. Okay. She comes out of the simulation momentarily whenever this trigger starts. Right. So she'll yeah. be thinking of the song. And when she starts singing the song, she starts to experience weird things. Um, the trigger song was actually written by Harry Styles. Yeah. Yeah. And he wrote it in just five minutes, which is pretty cool. Yeah. I did have that written down. I think that's kind of fun. Yeah. You got to have a Harry Styles song if you're going to have, you have movie. to. You have to. I mean, I doubt Christopher Nolan had a song in Dunkirk done by Harry Styles but was Harry Styles in Dunkirk yeah that's like his most famous like he it was such a big deal because it was like him breaking out into like a serious acting oh, movie okay okay I haven't seen that one I'll have to watch it yeah you'd probably like it it's a Christopher Nolan 
Um, Special. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's like a World War Two. World War Two. Yeah, it is. Yeah, German army evacuated during the fierce, fierce battle in World War Two. Yeah, Dunkirk is a battle in World War Two. Yeah. You know, every time I hear someone say battle, I start battle. singing the. Game of Thrones intro song in my head. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> okay, so it's going to sound super nerdy, <laughs> but I made a running. I don't even think I can tell this. I made a running <laughs> playlist. You're already doing it. Here That's we called, go. <laughs> That's called music scores, like running or something. Mm -hmm. And it's all like the intense music scores <laughs> that I like that are good for running because they have like a really fun like build up. And there is a Game of Thrones song on there. I think it's called like Dragonstone. What a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> we love nerds here. All yeah, nerds are welcome. Especially movie nerds. You're very welcome. Not quite as welcome <laughs> as Harry Styles, but please join us with your ears. <laughs> um, so next, Alice gets really suspicious about Margaret. And so she's riding on this trolley thing and the plane crashes and then she goes and visits the headquarters. I literally wrote, why, why, why would she go out in the desert alone? I think she should have just pretended like nothing was going on. Mm -hmm. Just live your perfect little life. I would love to live in that community. Are you kidding me? Olivia Wilde's character. I think that's me. I would be like, put me in. I'm there. Mm -hmm. Let me live in the sim. Um, but yeah, I don't understand why she did that. She could have just been like, oh, somebody will figure it out. All the men that go out there every day and work out there, maybe they will handle the plane crash. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think so. I think nobody was listening to her because even like the bus driver was like pretending he didn't see anything. I also don't, I don't think he saw anything. I think that she. So, OK, here's what I think was going on. Whenever she was like experiencing something weird happening, I think she, because her body is in the simulation, I think she was like kind of sort of controlling the reality that she was experiencing. Yeah. So she was already feeling like she was already suspicious of what was going on in the town. And if you remember, Margaret's son was taking the the little red train around. And so I think she like morphed those two things together and just like kind of create, I think she was like kind of making it up. That's and, interesting. And like seeing what she wanted to see because she wanted it. She, she wanted a reason to go out there. And that was her reason was yeah. the plane crash. So she's like creating all these scenarios in her, in, in the simulation, but like dreaming them up kind of, to like make herself question what was going on. That's a really interesting theory. I think it definitely that definitely could be true. I also think it could be parts of her reality kind of like squeezing in. Like if maybe Falling in apart. real life, like there was a plane that like went by her house or something and mm -hmm. like the sounds kind of triggered that to happen like in her reality in this. Yeah, like the weird rumbling. What whatever. was the rumbling? Yeah, like I wonder if like maybe that was stuff that was happening to her body in the real world and it would get mm – -hmm. it would kind of infiltrate the virtual reality. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. We need like a psychologist to come on and tell us. The power Explain. Of but it is all fake, so I guess we'll never know. It's one of those things. We need a sequel. Give us Don't Worry Darling Part 2. That would – I wonder, like, what <laughs> the premise would be. <coughs> okay, we can spend some Her time talking Her waking about up because she wakes up at the end, but you don't ever see what happens. So then she's got to wake up and she's got to go find Frank IRL and kick his ass, expose yeah. him for what's going on and how he's okay. treating these people. So I'm having, like, a – you know, like the Bernstein Bears thing with the Mandela effect? Like you always thought something was a certain way. When I watched this movie on Monday and <laughs> we talked about this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the movie ended with like Florence Pugh like waking up and being like, oh my God. And then like that's how it ends. Mm -hmm. And she like breathes in. She's like, <gasps> yeah, I 
know that there was a different ending to that movie <laughs> that I have seen where she like wakes up and like she's got to get the stuff off of her eyes and she like runs away and like Harry Styles is chasing her or something and like or no Harry Styles is dead so he couldn't be chasing her but like the thought is she that wakes that- up next to dead Harry Styles oh my god can you imagine oh yeah I just I something in my brain like made me think there was a different ending to the movie that I like missed maybe it was just like more intense at the end the first time i watched it but i think I you know. dreamt it a weird moment i sometimes have like super vivid dreams that i think are real so maybe that happened to you yeah i have this or i don't know maybe there was maybe there's an alternate ending maybe you watched no. the like director's cut or something i spent a really long time googling and <laughs> it's not the case <laughs> Because I was like, convinced. I have to prove this. <laughs> yeah, I was like, for sure, like, I've discovered, like, the secret of Don't Worry Darling that nobody knows. Like, Netflix messed up the ending, but that's not the case. And <laughs> all I found was that there was – there used to be, like, a different ending in the script. They changed something mm. about the script ending, but mm. I don't remember what exactly it was. It wasn't what I what I just told you. <laughs> And it was like something large that like there wasn't any – it wasn't like a different filming. It was like they made the executive decision before they like wrote – you know, like finished writing the script for the characters yeah. or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. So we get some interesting moments while mm-hmm. she is going through this like dreams versus reality and kind of what the heck is going on. Mm-hmm. So we've mentioned some of it. She gets a lot of like visions. She gets a lot of flashbacks. She gets a lot of gaslighting. A lot, a of, lot gaslighting. of gaslighting. Everyone's gaslighting Florence in this movie. It's not good. Alice, They're all gaslighting everyone, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like the whole concept is of one big gaslight. One big gaslight. <laughs> yeah. So but there's some there's some memorable moments. She sees Margaret in the glass mirror in her dance class. Mm-hmm. Which that was a pretty like striking moment. I yeah, think. it was. Yeah. Um, and that's where she kind of realizes, like, oh my gosh, like something's going on with Margaret. Like they have her trapped in here. Mm-hmm. Um, I I wrote down. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote down. Alice is losing her mind, and then I also said, "Why are the dance girls always the crazy ones?" Why are the dance girls always <laughs> the crazy ones? Spicy takes. Yeah. I'm not a dance girl, so I can't relate to that at all. Crazy Alice crazy. also gets trapped in the hallway in her house. where So it's like a hallway mm-hmm. and it's wall on She's one side. She's cleaning the, the window. Glass wall on one, the other side. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like, the glass starts, like, closing in on her and she mm-hmm. gets, like, stuck in there. I, yeah. That was really weird. I Like, I never figured out what was going on with that until mm-hmm. oh yes maybe like so right after that there's a scene where she saran wraps her face and like yeah tries to kill herself yeah. and then she sort of realizes like oh my god i can't breathe what the heck is happening and she like, takes it off so maybe like that has something to do with it like almost like a way of i don't know the the hallway cl- closing in part like i don't really get that so i think what was happening I think that her reality was becoming distorted because she stopped, like, just believing. Okay. Yeah. Just, yeah. like, blindly believing because she started to question what was going on around her. And so okay. I think her reality was just kind of going crazy. So it's, and, like, the power of her mind being, like, I'm trapped. Like, I need to fix this. Well, not only that, but, like, so she's in a simulation. Okay. And, like everything that's going on around her is being controlled by what she believes is going on. So if she, if she was like thinking like, Oh, like what if this wall behind me starts closing in on me? She, she could be just like controlling the simulation. That's And then when she starts to freak out, she like snaps out of it and it gets, goes away. That's really, I'm having some weird thought experience. Cause it's not real, right? Like it's not real. So it's like all in her head. Everything that's going on there is all in her head. So that's she could be like, so they're constantly like mm. feeding them like this is the perfect place. You don't ask questions. This is how your life goes. You wake up, your husband leaves, you clean, you cook, you do this, you do this. 
everything is like set out for them the way it's supposed to be. And when she starts thinking for herself, that's when things start getting weird because yeah. she's changing, like she's controlling it. And instead of controlling it to be this like perfect world, she's controlling it to be weird, like without even knowing that she's doing it. Because she has no idea what's going on. Do you think it's like mistakes in the simulation code? Like they like mi- they like left out things like what if the person does this? And so that's why it's like getting all distorted. I think it's, it was pro- – let's get a little technical here. Okay. I think it was probably written to be controlled by the person that's in the simulation. But that's okay. why they're constantly fed like here's how your day is going to go. Here's like, this is what, this is, this is the perfect world. This is, you love your husband. You're obsessed Mm. with your husband. But like everything, they're being fed all this information to keep that their brain keeping this world perfect. Interesting. I like kind of agree with some of that, but I feel like the interpretation I had was almost like they wrote the code for this like town And they, like, could go in there, the 72 of them. And then, like, there was the billboard that said, like, victory part two, like, coming later or coming soon or whatever. And it was almost like they were developing that part of the simulation, but they hadn't made it yet. So, like, that's why it didn't exist. That's why nothing existed in the desert. Like, I almost thought it was, like, a video game. Like, they had written the world that existed. And, like, anytime they tried to go outside of, like, the confines of it, that's when things started to break or distort or become weird yeah so yeah Yeah. could i mean it's it's a psychological thriller so it's really up to the viewer well and frank says to like you're challenging me like i'm keeping you around because you're challenging me and he's supposedly the creator of it so well so let's let's talk about frank frank is hated him the antagonist and he's played by chris pine who i thought did a pretty good job. I love Chris Pine. This character is the bane of my existence. Well, he's a I nightmare. Think, I think that is the mark of a good portrayal, though, yes. right? Like he was yeah, supposed that's what to I'm be saying. hated. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And we get this strange battle that occurs between Frank and Alice, mm-hmm. and it starts with you know we talked about at Frank's house when he like is watching her and staring in her eyes while she's having sex with Harry Styles but it kind of like escalates throughout the movie and culminates at Alice's dinner party yeah yeah they really go head to head they do and I, I couldn't figure out like what he wanted out of her like I couldn't either it kind of felt like once he realized that she wouldn't just like blindly go with everything like once margaret started acting weird um and she was kind of like she was like margaret what are you doing but also like tell me more Mm -hmm. he was like all right let me like lean into this and like have her kind of be the guinea pig for this like to perfect my simulation here Mm -hmm. But then he just like things just kept happening. And I was like, I like have no idea like what he's getting at anymore. Yeah. Like, you know how in like Scooby-Doo, like whenever they find the perpetrator, they always explain to them what's going on a little bit. I feel like I was getting a little bit of that vibe. Like the bad guy was almost like. I've been found out, like, let me lean into this because I'm just so obsessed with, like, being the bad guy. Like, yeah, I I think he was just getting kind of crazy. But maybe it could have been, too, he knew he was going to erase everybody's memories, so maybe he just was, like, so unconcerned. Like, he was, like, crazy because he thought he was in control of everything. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He thought it would just kind of, like, go away, but it Mm -hmm. it didn't. She remembered it all. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I... Um, so that was an interesting scene. And then the movie, the last like probably like quarter of the movie is really like the reveal. And there's a lot that happens. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, there's the party where she confronts Olivia Wilde and 
tells her like, hey, something really strange is going on. And when Jack just kind of promoted from there. Yeah. And yeah. there's the whole scene that I thought was like really unnecessary. But the whole scene with the dancing and like the stripper, I was like, I, yeah. I don't understand like the relevance of this scene. Yeah, I feel like it was supposed to show that this simulation was invented by this guy, Chris Pine or Jack who, or Frank and other men who like kind of wanted to be like a boys club, like a men's club. Like it was very like. But also not really because like they left the simulation every day and like yeah. had to go to work, like real work and then would come back and like. I I get it. Trapping someone somewhere without their consent is like not good. But also yeah, not good. Definitely it not good. Kind of felt like they were all coming from a good place. Like they meant well, like they were trying to make better lives for their yeah. wives. Like Jack's whole thing was he just wanted her to be happy and like that was the only way he could think for her to be happy. No, that is not the impression that I got at all. That's what I, I got from it because all the men were like all of them were head over heels for their wives and like doing this for their wives so their wives didn't like have to work and didn't have to like worry about anything. Well, I I don't know. I don't think that's true. I got the sense that like Jack was like a deadbeat boyfriend kind of and Florence Pugh's character was like a doctor, like supporting both of them. And his solution, instead of like figuring out something to do in his real life, was to like trap Florence in this like fake life. So I thought yeah, it was but, actually really sinister. No, because you see them, you when she goes in for her electroshock therapy, um, you see their old life. She has a flashback. Of mm -hmm. like probably her last memory, honestly. And she comes back from work. She doesn't want she doesn't want to do anything. She just wants to go to bed. She doesn't eat anything. She doesn't take a shower. She doesn't really interact with him. She looks miserable. She's tired. Like, sure, she loves her job and like she loves her life that she has. But if you're looking at it through his eyes, which is kind of what you get. In that situation, he just sees that she's miserable trying to support the two of them because he can't figure out what to do with his life. And so he's like trying. And you hear, too, there's that whole scene where he's like, like, how am I supposed to support you? And she's like, well, I'll just pick up an extra shift, even though she's already working 30 hour shifts. Yeah. So I and think he's like being really creepy. I think he's super creepy. And I think Olivia Wilde's character, too, like kind of echoes that because like she talks about like she chose to go in the simulation because she like lost her kids in the real world. So I think she was just like crazy. Like I think like everybody was like kind of like trying to escape something. And I yeah, think it yeah. was I think it was pretty sinister for Harry Styles character to like unknowingly trap his girlfriend in that. Like I think that is absolutely Yeah. I'm not saying terrifying. it's good, but I'm saying what I'm saying is like I can see where it's not like it wasn't coming from like a bad place like they meant well maybe i don't think like the people that created it meant well i don't know I, I thought it was it's like a cult yeah very like culty vibes like yes. really really strange yes i think you just really want to like harry styles character by the end of the movie i was literally terrified of him like when he was yelling at Alice and like getting violent with her, I was like, he is so scary. When was he violent with her? Like at their house, like in the in Victory. When, when like, she, she was like, What did you do? Like, yeah, when she's she, like, what did you do? Yeah. And she killed him because he's being so like violent. He's yeah. yelling at her. Yeah, I didn't – I don't like when people yell. So, like, that was just, like, very – it, like, got my heart racing. I didn't like it. Yeah. It – yeah. 
Yeah. No, so, that was not that was not good. But also that scene like effectively shows like how much they do love each other though because instead of her just like like truly freaking out like she was freaked out but instead of her like going absolutely batshit crazy she was like what did you do like what have you done like like I know and he was like I I just wanted you to be happy and like this is this was my solution yeah but I also think he was kind of like in la la land because he like like part of his solution too was like, well, let's get pregnant. Like, let's have a baby. Like, I think that he, and she was like, I don't want that. I think he was drinking the Kool-Aid. Like, I think Frank wanted them to have a baby because in Frank's eyes, like that's the next step. And that like gets you even closer to staying. If you like start your family there, even though it's not going to be real. Yeah. Frank was creepy. I think that, and you kind of see it too, like in that flashback scene that Jack was being like brainwashed yeah. into thinking that like this was going to solve all his problems, which is like classic cult behavior. Like that is yeah. how cults work generally. Yeah, this is this is a very clear example of a cult. So through the reveal, it starts with after the dinner party scene, Alice is like talking with Jack and she says, oh, we're going to escape. And then she goes in the car and she gets grabbed from the car. Mm -hmm. That scene was very surprising. And that's when we start to realize like, oh shit, there's something bigger going on here. And Jack, Jack is in on it. Jack is in on it. Correct. Yeah. So then um, after some more stuff happens and she kind of like snaps back to reality again, we discover that Alice is actually a doctor and Harry Styles is like kind of a dweeb. Yeah. I have to say the moment like we have been (laughs) seeing Harry Styles as this like beautiful, beautiful fifties stud husband. Perfect guy. The moment that we get the look of him like on his computer, like his hair is long. He's like looking rough. Like, I was shook. I was like, Harry Styles looks unwell. <laughs> like, he looks horrible. Yeah, they they effectively made him look like a deadbeat. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then we finally discover that the Victory Project is actually a simulation. Alice kills Jack. She discovers that Bunny has known all along. And we get this car chase through the desert that culminates with Florence Pugh running barefoot in a blood spattered dress up to the like headquarters entrance. Yeah. So my jaw was literally on the floor. Like when (laughs) we and when I say we like Florence Pugh and the audience comes to the realization of what's really going on. I literally mm-hmm. said, wait a damn minute. Jack forced her into this cult. OMG, they're in a fucking simulation. Yeah. And then I said, this is the scariest idea I have ever heard of. <laughs> this is like literally a nightmare. Like, yeah. can you imagine? Although, I would, I think I would really enjoy being a housewife with no cares in the world. Um, I don't want to do it this way. <laughs> yeah, that's... I I think this is crazy. It's terrifying. The chase scene at the end I thought was like so wild and interesting that they ended this movie with a car chase. Like of and the all people things. like scaling the mountain, the men yes. in the red suits. <laughs> yeah. I think it just made the whole thing feel like kind of goofy. Like it was so mm-hmm. so extra. Um, yeah, but it, it did was work very though. Action-packed. Like it kind of like wrapped everything up. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, as I already mentioned, it ends with like Florence Pugh traveling through back to reality, and then mm-hmm. opening her eyes, and you see her on the bed with Harry Styles. Um, how did you feel about like? No, you all don't see the- her. It's just we- a black screen. It's just a black screen, and she oh, like yeah. gasps, and that's the end. Yeah. Um. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I really thought there was another ending. I don't know what's going on with my brain. If you know me, so if you've like listened to this podcast at all, you know that I love a movie that is like at the end, it's like wrapped up in a bow and they tell you exactly what's happening Mm -hmm. and what's going to happen and blah, blah, blah. This, I hated the ending. Absolutely hated the ending of this movie. I was pissed, actually. Like the movie ended and I was like, absolutely not. This is unacceptable. Like you're just going to leave us there with all these questions. There are so many questions unanswered. So many. Yeah, I agree. It would have been nice to – I think it would have been cool to have her wake up in the real world and like kind of see at least like – 30 seconds of kind of like what happens to her in the real world. Like she wakes up, whether it's like she wakes up next to the real Jack and like sees him dead there or like what it, whatever it is, but that could give you like, it would still be ambiguous, Mm -hmm. but it would give you some sort of closure that like, oh, she made it back to the real world kind of thing. Also, how long have they been in this simulation? Like, is no one in the real world worried about her? Like did all these weird wacky things like actually happen to her? Like, what? Like, when she when she went through this electroshock therapy, was her real body going through the therapy? Or is it part of the simulation? Like, so many questions unanswered yeah. that they could have easily answered by having, like, the ending be, like, her, like, being alive. Yeah, that is confusing. I do remember on this watch, because this was my second time watching the movie, like, at least second time thinking that like what is going on with all these me- this medical stuff like is this part of the simulation or part of the reality mm-hmm. and i think they and it's i think it's fun to kind of blur the lines a little bit too because it kind of leaves it up to the viewer for your interpretation i think we spent a lot of time in this discussion alone kind of talking about how we both interpreted the movie and the simulation and how it works like mm-hmm. very differently Yep. Yeah. Um, I do to have some Easter eggs from the okay. movie. Yeah. If you fun. want to talk about them. Okay. Yeah. So, and these are all kind of Easter eggs that in a second viewing you would probably pick up on okay. and they would kind of allude to the fact that they're in a simulation. Okay. I'll see if so, I picked up on them as you go through them. The first one is – um the plane so when she sees the plane flying there's like a moment where it waves mm-hmm. like it gets like wavy for a second to kind of show that like it's probably not real not real or it's like breaking yeah. the simulation plane or whatever um the second one is deb who is perpetually pregnant she is pregnant the whole movie the yeah. whole movie she drinks alcohol they I, talk about yeah. how the pregnant wife is drunk um yeah. And then after Alice's therapy, she can't remember Deb. And Bunny says, oh, she's the one who's always pregnant, insinuating that she probably won't ever give birth. She's going to be pregnant forever. Why would you choose that? (laughs) And then the third one is when Kevin, that's Margaret's husband, when he pulls the curtain to shield Margaret from Alice's sight, you get Mm -hmm. a glimpse of Alice laying in the bed unconscious with her eyes, with the eye things on. Yes. Yeah. Like very quick. I did catch that. Um, okay, I have two more. Right before Alice experiences a weird glitch in the simulation, she rubs her eyes every time. Mm, I didn't notice that. So she's like agitated by the stuff. Like in real life, the things that's holding her eyes open, she's like agitated by them and like aware of them. Oh. And then the last one, one is when they break the fourth wall. Um. It's when Alice is sliding down into the bathtub, but her f- reflection doesn't follow. Oh. So her reflection's still looking at you. That's creepy as hell. Yeah. So those are my Easter eggs that I noticed. I'm sure there's <laughs> a lot of little ones like mm-hmm. throughout too. Because I, I like, no, that's definitely not all of them. Because I noticed a lot of like weird stuff going on. Yeah. Those are some like noticeable ones. Yeah. Last thing too I just want to mention is how do you feel about – because at the very end of the movie, you know, you see Florence 
Pew puts her hands up on the door and then like it kind of turns red and it turns into the eye. But then it starts kind of flashing between like all these weird figures and they use the dancers like a ring of like, I don't know what you call it. You see them. that like, throughout the film. Yeah, yeah. And it's used yeah. throughout the film. And um, I guess that's supposed to like represent kind of like the dance class a little bit. So I took that as um, – and I – the when I like made this realization is when they show Jack putting Alice into the simulation or she's already in the simulation and he's like putting himself in. Yeah. And you see them on the r- the ceiling in yeah. their bedroom. What I assumed was going on there is it's whatever like that is is almost like like hypnotic. Yeah. And like keeping them in the simulation. Yeah. And that makes sense. not like waking up. And so when she's like having these like weird like flashbacks or dreams or whatever she thinks they are, she's just like going in between reality and the simulation and like seeing sure. them seeing the whatever it is a a projector I don't know yeah yeah that's a good that's a good observation that's what I I thought that was pretty cool yeah yeah so that's pretty much all I had to talk about I don't know if you if you missed anything that you wanted to discuss Um, not a ton there was one thing I had written down Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, here it is. So, and this one's about casting. I was supposed to talk about it earlier, but we got sidetracked. Okay. So, Margaret was originally going to be played by Dakota Johnson. Oh, interesting. She would have been good for that role, too. Yeah. And I, like, after I read that, I kept being like, man, like, if she had been in this film, like, and it would just would have, like, heightened the excitement around it. Because she was oh, really, yeah. she's, I mean, she still is like really, really popular, but like last year was kind of one of her shining years. Yeah. What else was she in last year? She's been in a bunch of stuff, honestly. I don't know exactly last year what she was in, but she has just like been getting, gaining and gaining popularity. Yeah, I just know her from Fifty Shades. I don't remember anything she's been in recently. She was in the remake of Suspiria, yeah. which I saw. Oh yeah, um, but that was that was a while before this movie. Yeah, the one that she turned this movie down to be in was The Lost Daughter, which I have okay. not seen. But yeah, I haven't seen that either. Yeah, I haven't seen any of her new ones, but I mean, I'm sure they're good. Yeah, but she she would have been just another good talking point for all the mm-hmm. the discussion around this movie. Agreed. I love Dakota Johnson. I think she's so pretty. Okay. Is it time <laughs> to rate the movie? <coughs> Let's do it. <coughs> Liz, do you want to give your rating first as a reminder? Yes. To the audience, we rate our movies on Letterboxd. So here's a shameless plug to go follow us both on Letterboxd. We rate these movies and every movie that we see. Mm-hmm. And the rating system on Letterboxd is zero to five stars with half star increments. All right. I gave this movie four and a half out of five stars. I thought I had so much fun watching it. It was visually beautiful. I was like, immediately invested in the lives of the characters and I like the aesthetic that they portrayed is just like I just loved it so much I had so much fun watching it even though I had so many questions and the end was my the end was a nightmare for me um (laughs) sometimes it makes me good though yeah no I I think that there needs to be some lore released about them (laughs) and everything that happened so i'm like a little (laughs) shook that your rating is so high but i'm also (laughs) like the more i think about it the less i'm surprised like this tracks is a movie that you would like Mm -hmm. um and it is entertaining to watch so if you haven't seen it i would 
I don't know who's listening at this point who hasn't seen it, but if you haven't seen it, I would recommend that you see it. It's good. I've watched mm-hmm. it multiple times. However, I gave this movie two and a half However, stars on this two watch. And a half. <laughs> yeah. And I think the first time, like I had it previously logged in Letterbox, I had it at three. But I think after watching it, like you kind of start to see through like some of the things that the tricks, like some of the tricks, they mm-hmm. get a little old. They're not as like fun the second time you watch them. Mm-hmm. And I like, I think this movie is entertaining. So I'd say I think it definitely deserves like a good solid 50% of the way there. However, it's like not that good of a movie in my opinion. It's, it is kind of confusing and um, that I don't know if it like closes the loop or closes the, yeah, closes the loop like well enough at the end. Like I feel like I left a little unsatisfied. You wanted more. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought too like another thing that's like in its favor is just pretty original. I haven't seen anything quite like this, like with this idea. And that could just be that. I'm uncultured and haven't seen a lot of movies, but this was the first one like this. And it like really made me think, I was like, hmm, what if my husband has me in a simulation right now? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You need to watch like movies from like the nineties. I think (laughs) that is my recommendation. I watch nineties rom-coms. So yeah, I probably do need to watch some additional nineties movies. Okay. What about our write-ins for yeah, this one? So <clears throat> the people had things to say this oh, week oh. about these write-ins or, or about this movie. So um, I've been trying to keep it to four, but I have five this week that I want to talk about. So okay. here we go. So the first write-in is from actually someone who knows Courtney personally. Her name, her handle is Jen underscore Yates. And she said, I love Don't Worry Darling with like five exclamation points. She said, love the dark aspect of it. I actually watched it with Court. Oh, yeah. I do remember that. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, because we watched it with my sister. How fun. Maybe I've seen this movie three times then. I thought you said you saw it three times. Yeah. I don't know. I've seen it. I've seen it at, at least twice at this point. Okay. So... <coughs> Sorry. Um, the next one is from Popcorny Movies, and she said she gave us an alliteration, which I love. Okay. She said, "Stylish, sexy, stale, <laughs> stale." <laughs> that's kind of that's kind of my take. <laughs> like, yeah. it's not. I I don't want to damper your love that you think this is original but i don't think it's that original so i'm just a little stale that's why <laughs> opinions are so fun because we can yes. all have a different one yeah 100 percent. and every time you watch a movie you can have a different experience it matters yeah. who you watch it with like what mm-hmm. state of mind you're in like yeah yeah and sometimes with those movies like especially the mystery movies sometimes you don't want to watch them again because you don't want to ruin the experience that you had the first time you know nothing will ever be the same as like the first time you watch a movie yeah i agree with that yeah there's so many movies that i'm like man i wish i could just like go back and watch it again like for the first time again Mm. all right so the next write-in this one was a multi-parter we had multiple multi-parters okay (laughs) y'all had a lot to say about this this one is from l sheeb shout out lauren um and she said this is kind of long, but she said when they finally revealed the mysterious secret, they did nothing with it. The children fake. If you kill a guy, what happens? Dies for real. Quick drive away. The end. I could have watched one to two more hours on Rat Tail Harry Styles and everyone's real life backstories. Rat Tail Harry. <laughs> Rat Tail Harry Styles was a sight to be seen. <laughs> if for anything, you need to watch this movie because of that moment in the film. Yeah. It's iconic. Yeah. He's so ugly. And Harry Styles is good looking, but he's so ugly. (laughs) He's so ugly. It's shocking how ugly. And they like the way that they do it, he's like he's just like at his computer and he looks at me, he's like, hey, like, (laughs) like, dude, that's so bad. Oh my God. Okay. 
Um, okay, so then I'm, I'm only going to do four. I'll keep it to four. Okay, so this last one is from Rank It Up, which I think we've had, we've done one from them before. But they said, never watched it, but the press leading up to it was cinema in itself. <laughs> oh, it was. <laughs> it really was. This is like one of the only movies that I can really remember before like the Barbie Oppenheimer stuff. Like there just being so much like, chatter about like leading up to the movie and mm -hmm. it really had nothing to do with the movie itself it was it was all because of the people in it it was mm -hmm. crazy yeah so much drama so just like for the sake of drama honestly now that i'm thinking about it it could have just been marketing genius yeah it, it could have all was. just planted these stories around just for funsies well i mean that was one of the things like um i mentioned earlier that harry styles and olivia wilde like when they went to viewings of this movie, like they weren't really interacting with each other. They're like purposefully staying away from each other. And like, I almost feel like they like, I don't know if that was purposeful to like stir up controversy or like, like I feel like they should have been like all over each other. Like, or were they ever even it. dating? Was it all just a ruse to get people to watch the movie? <laughs> what's real and what's not. We'll never know. Oh my God. Don't even, <laughs> don't even start this. Like, idea that olivia wilde like created a fake reality like her movie created a fake reality i didn't say it you did <laughs> <laughs> okay is that all your write-ins <laughs> yeah that's it for the write-ins so now we've got like what the rest of the world thinks mm -hmm. and it's pretty pitiful not gonna lie so the letterbox <laughs> average is a 2.9 out of five which is better than what courtney gave it but that's like pretty low for like netflix or for the letterbox average mm -hmm. um the tomato meter the critic score is a 38 yeah. percent which yeah. shocking shocking <laughs> the audience scores is was pretty good on rotten tomatoes a 74 percent yeah i think it's a fun watch the imdb was a 6.3 out of 10, which is okay. And then only 61% of Google users like the movie, which I think is the lowest one we've had on the podcast so far. Yeah, nobody rates a movie on Google. Like, so like- <laughs> Did I you like, like this, yes or I, no? <laughs> yeah, like, so to see a lower Google rating is kind of like, ooh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got like going out of your way to do that one. Yep. Okay. Well, that's all we've got, folks, for Don't Worry Darling. Definitely interact with all of our stuff on this one because I think it sparks a lot of um, debate and memes of people from when all of this was going down in the press. So, so. much controversy. So much controversy. <laughs> but anywho, it is time for us to say goodbye. So yes. goodbye, Be Critics fam. Thanks for tuning in to our Don't Worry Darling episode. Be sure to leave us a rating or review wherever you're watching. Drop an answer to our poll and Q&A section on Spotify if that's where you're getting this episode. Um, share the podcast with a friend. That's really the best way that you can support us. And then if you're feeling it, like Courtney said, be sure to interact with us. Put a comment on our YouTube. Honestly, I think that helps. And give it a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Just comment on everything. Give us likes and comments and share, 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 share. Yeah, so like important this video. To share. Like it. <laughs> yes, down below. Yes. Click the click the little buttons. And if you do want to find more information about the podcast, you can find that information and our whole <laughs> podography on our website, becritics.com, where you find links to all of the things on our link tree in the episode show notes. Yep. And next week, if you liked this week's episode, be sure to check us out next week because we're going to be talking about another Florence Pugh movie. This mm -hmm. one is called A Good Person. It's got Florence Pugh and Morgan Freeman, which is a super interesting combination. This movie actually came out earlier this year, and it's going to be the first independent film that we're covering on the podcast. So that's very Ooh, exciting. How special. And Florence Pugh was an executive producer. So it's oh yeah, my gosh, perfect go, for girl. a spotlight season for her. <laughs> yeah. So be sure to subscribe and follow so you don't miss it. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. All right. I think that's it. So bye. We'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys. Bye. bye.